Welcome to Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters. Money on Tap is where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. My name is Seth Crossman, And I'm Ben Brayshaw. Good morning. Good morning. How are you or doing? Or good afternoon. Yes. However you're jumping into uh, the show today, wherever you're finding us, we are, we're glad you're here. Um, and one of the fun things that we get an opportunity to do is connect with you. And you can do that by calling us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And that is also the website where we have loads of information for you, past episodes and uh, current episodes that you can listen to of Money on Tap. It's at www. Do I even have to do that anymore? Does everybody know? It's like, w, you know, uh, I think, it's just yourmoneyontap.com. I, it. I think people get it now. Yeah, yourmoneyontap.com. All right. It's a pretty sophisticated audience today. We know you are. In light of that, you can also find us at Facebook backslash 3D investing or uh, my favorite folks is the the Twitter the Twitter spot. You can tweet with me at uh, bfg underscore llc. I like what we've got coming ahead of us here, Seth. I'm kind of seeing a little bit in the future, and uh, I'm kind of excited to uh, to share it. Oh, that gives me that gives me chills down my spine. The the clairvoyance of Benjamin Brayshaw. How, how many times do people walk in the office and be like, "So what's going to happen? What do you?" Oh, every what, day. It's just like they're not asking what do you think. It's like what, well, what's going to happen? I mean, what, what should I yes. do? How do I? How do I? <laughs> so we've well, been we've been lying to people for years, telling them we don't know exactly what the market's going to do, but today we do. That's true. <laughs> that's what's <it's> working. <laughs> I, I don't know how we've gotten away with the the uh, the misinformation out there uh, for so long, but uh, it, 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 we're going to get there, we're, and we're actually. We're actually going to get on topic eventually here. And the topic for today is Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's going to hit 30, folks. It's going to hit 30. Yeah. It's going to hit 30. We, we did a Dow show a while ago, and it's, this is like 2017 when, it, when it, um, it hit 20. And that was a lot of fun, but that was a little after the fact. And we're going to bring home to you why this Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, I'm like, I didn't say that. Uh, we're <laughs> we're going to just talk about the Dow Jones, folks. We're going to have some fun in this show. And uh, we're going to get a little bit of history. We're going to get a, a touch on the ifs, thans um, around the Dow and some important dates. And what does that mean for you? Well, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about this. I mean, the Dow's over 27,000. Things are looking great. And there's all these people. There's the negatives. There's the positives. There's the, you know... Everyone's got an opinion on what's happening next, and there's so many moving pieces and the economic puzzle here, you know, and a lot of people need some direction. A lot of people are seeing a lot of trend changing, a lot of things happening, a lot of indicators for concern, a lot of indicators for potential major growth, and people are trying to hedge themselves, and we're seeing, I mean, the market's reporting less and less investments inside, you know, the private money flying in. So that's, that's kind of interesting, and I, th I think people really need to have, have some understanding. All right, but before we get too far down that road, it is time for Money in the News. I love the lighthearted stuff I get to find here. And, you know, you Oregonians are quite a bunch of uh -huh. uh, fun people. And uh -huh. I know you saw this article. and. Uh -huh. But you got some rabid bats, Seth, in Southern Oregon, and <laughs> I was noticing, I was noticing that this might be a, a real issue for you guys. So mm -hmm. I hope mm -hmm. I didn't bother you with this article after the goat article last time. <laughs> <laughs> the goat yoga. <laughs> you guys got some crazy stuff going on over there, but uh, um, we got it all. Yeah, I, well, no, I mean, but this is this is like a public health warning over bats. I mean, do you guys not know not to touch bats who are flopping on the ground, looking um, foaming no, at the mouth? I have, I have, <laughs> I have touched many a bat flopping on the ground, and uh, you know, survived to, to be here today and tell you about it. Uh, he, he actually, protected no, his dog, and he got bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. No one's read the article. But go ahead, Seth. You tell, you tell the story. Oh, we'll give you the Oregonian guys. bias. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the, here's, here's the gist, folks, is that when you see the bat flopping around on the ground, um, wear gloves or call, call a professional – uh, if you're not that daring or if you're not able to find gloves, just call a professional to take care of this. You do not have to subject yourself to um, rabies. I remember as a kid, a friend of ours brought a bat to our house. Yeah, I don't remember where it came from, but it, it was she was like one of these people that would like gather up animals that were lost. And she had a possum, like a baby possum one time. And it was just the cutest <laughs> stuff. And so this is a baby bat that she found. And we all, you know, got to hold the baby bat. And today I don't even know if that would be. See, like, that's the problem right there, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. <laughs> this is what we grew up with. <laughs> this is this is what, this article has nothing to do with finance. I just after the goat article, just, I was like, you know, there's a bad article know. for you. So Bless you. You are so my person. Thank you. <laughs> so hey, but this is this is to our crystal ball. This, I, you know, we got a couple articles here, Seth, and this is interesting. So, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren um, mm-hmm. from the uh, the great state of uh, Massachusetts, uh, right around the corner from me, love it, is saying buyer beware in the stock market crash is coming. What do you think? What do you? That's think? a lie. That's a you. Lie. You are sneaky. <laughs> You're just you're so <laughs> sneaky with that. That's not at all what she's saying. She's saying there we are so far away from a crash that, and matter of fact, that she doesn't even think that. I mean, she's like she's saying we are nowhere near a crisis uh, that happened over ten years ago. You know, um, her response to uh, to that is what? There's no crisis, uh, and, and even if a recession is anywhere near. Is not even a question that she really. It, it She's not even taking. Yeah, and, it's not even a conversation. No. Exactly. And yeah, I think it's interesting because she, you know, for as much as as the Democratic side is concerned about the market or trying to create woes about the market on some level, she's actually stepping in and, and talking about some of the things that are going well in our economy. Like, for instance, consumer debt is dropped to all time lows compared to income, and I mean it's Pretty, it's. It's phenomenal. And remember when yeah. we did that, that podcast a long time ago about how millennials have spun the coin to become more savers than Gen X, Gen Y, whatever all the gens are. But the millennials yeah. are actually big big into saving. Not big into investing, but big into saving. Remember that? I do. I do. Uh, and good job, people. Good job minimizing the debt and taking advantage that the um, interest rates are low. So people are paying off their credit cards and getting rid of those. Uh, now, student loans, that's a totally different story. But uh, I, I, I have a, a funny or an interesting story about this the other day when you talk about the, uh, the millennial. We were having a conversation and, um, and he was kind of going through some marriage counseling stuff that we were talking about. And the, the situation that came up was he doesn't even consider himself a saver. He's just not a spender at all. Like never spends money. That's interesting. So how do we get two people on this? On this? Well, we need to spend money because we're a family now and we have to do all these things. But, but there's usually a gas and a break in a relationship. Uh, and anyways, he was totally the breaks. But creating a budget around that is great. So if people, if this is what's going on right now, people are budgeting, people are spending less. Fantastic. Does that necessarily reflect on uh, uh, it, ultimately what's going to be happening happening in the economy? It's one one perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's a really interesting how people how, how they perceive their actions as not being a saver, but they're just not a spender. Like, <laughs> I think that's really very interesting. But in this article, they keep going on on how like there's all these really very strong, very financially studious kind of things going on, and you know, um, one of the things was that uh, credit card delinquencies they're up a little bit since 2015, but prior to that they're like at all time lows for the previous like roughly you know 20 years 22 years so that was really very interesting i mean people people are addressing debt and i think and i'm wondering too with the with the fear of debt i wonder how much the fear of our national debt has driven a lot of this like everyone's in debt and credit cards and and so forth i mean it's 
you know, it's it's just interesting because the debt conversation, everyone wants to get out of debt. And that's great. I love I love that story. There's the the movement Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey, you know, he's all about yeah. it. I mean, there's a nice movement in that area. People are taking debt seriously for probably one of the first times we've seen in our country at a grand scale in 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 mm-hmm. probably 25 30 years mm-hmm. or more. Yeah. Well, they've seen the catastrophe that can happen when it it isn't approached or it isn't addressed in our uh, personal or corporate finance, uh, both equally. Um, and coming back to that, Dave Ramsey, I was talking with um, an advisor this last week, and um, he w- has you know taught the class multiple times. I've taken the Dave, Dave Ramsey course, and I I think it's fantastic. What we we really both agree, and he'll he'll talk about this in teaching the course is that it's not about getting out of debt. I mean, that's what, that's what it, that, that's definitely one aspect of it. And it's not about this and that and this and that. What it ultimately boils down to is your relationship with finances and changing the way that you relate with finances. And that kind of goes back to the guy that I was talking about a, a minute ago. Uh, he's not a, he's not a saver. He just doesn't spend money. It's the same thing, right? But it's a different relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think some, sometimes you have a dependency relationship and sometimes you have a power relationship, you know? And some people are dependent on spending money and some people, you know, don't. And, and a lot of it has to do with upbringing, uh, you know, one, one side or another, someone doing without or, you know, having too much of or seen people who said, you know, I grew up and we didn't have any food. So, you know, so-and-so was spending money on something, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, there's learning sides of each curve on that. And it's just interesting to see how whatever has happened in the millennial cycle has really pushed people to become more savers. And that strengthens our economy greatly. Yeah. So next up is the other side of the coin, folks. What I see coming across our desk, uh, (laughs) it's a stronger, there's a, there's a stronger case out there these days for the bears, I think, than there was. And, uh, but the fed can't stop the market meltdown, uh, warns the forecaster who called the 2008 housing bust. And um, James Stack basically talking about uh, right now uh, where the Fed is at, what they're trying to do and the levers that they're trying to pull um, really not going to be able to stop what's ultimately going to be happening in the marketplace. And there's uh, or re-stimulate the economic growth. Um, So what do you do? What do you do in this case? Well, you know, I think this is where the three-dimensional side of of what we talk about is really, really relevant, Seth. You know, I mean, we're dealing with so many different moving parts. Like, for instance, the repatriation tax that Trump put in place that, you know, led to over a trillion dollars of assets coming back to America. And, you know, Apple bringing 253, I think, billion dollars, you know, back to America. I mean, that's, that's a quarter of their company. So Apple, the first trillion dollar company in the world brought a quarter of its company back in cash to America. A lot of these companies are buying back their stock, which is is producing a lot of substance, as I would call it, underneath their stock value. I mean, it's a buy and hold world, right? So the longer people buy and hold, you know, the stronger a stock becomes. And the more a company buys back their stock, I mean, that really does create some strength behind the stock value because they're retiring shares, essentially. So I think that's really interesting. They obviously we wouldn't buy back your stock if you didn't think it was cheap, you know. I mean, if you you're, you're going to overpay for your stock, so a lot of companies who brought money back to the United States did that. I think that's one thing that's there's substance behind the market. That an argument a number of years ago was that you know there was no real new money coming to America. Um, China made that claim, and and now we have a trillion dollars has come. So there's there's some substance there. I like. I think the trade deal eventually will come through with China. The worst case scenario is it will be the same trade deal we had before, right? But you know, we're right. trying to push higher, and people are concerned about how that's going to impact your, you know, our spending every day. And well, I mean, when you really break it down, the tariff argument—if that just gets higher—that's more taxes going into our into our global economy. I mean, our our national economy uh, from a standpoint to deal with some of our budget and so forth. Now I'll probably all be spent because I'm a pessimist in that area, but, um, but those are important things. And I think once that trade deal sets, that's going to bring more money to the United States. I mean, I think, and I believe, I believe it to be that it's going to cost Americans less than the amount of money China has to pay in addition to. And I think there's going to be a net win there, though. I do think it's going to affect all our pockets. 
Um, so, so there's a lot of moving pieces that I think really will spin positive for us, but that doesn't change some of the stuff that's going on where we're seeing a lot of movement to, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of movement, you know, the small caps are not performing as well. We're seeing a slowdown in that in the Russell 2000. We're seeing a lot of things that are happening inside the marketplace that are saying, hey, these are some indicators. I think this is why the crystal ball we're going we're gonna to offer in the show is going <laughs> to... <laughs> is going to be very, very interesting. And I, I mean, I, I say that obviously sarcastically, but, you know, there, there's a lot of things to consider than some of the the hype and what's going on. Yeah. Like what you said there, as far as the transportation uh, being, you know, soft, softness in the manufacturing sector, uh, weakness in small caps, these are all indicators that could uh, point in that direction. Um, but we've seen, you know, some of these pull back in prior year and then take off again. Uh, last six months, there was a, what was it? Oh my gosh. Best, uh, bull run or best, uh, six month period in 20 years in the market. Um, I mean, but there's also the other side where that's investor sentiment starts getting frothy, emotional appeal when everybody stops, you know, thinking about what are the underlying components to the economy and how that's going to play out. And they just keep going into, you know, ultimately, you know, the market, which, could be like six stocks right now, pretty much representing the bulk of the market in tech. Um, but uh, yeah, so a cool article, Stack getting out there, putting it out there, saying um, you know he would, he did uh, predict he was one of the predictors of the 2008 market collapse. And uh, his statement is here that uh, next two or three years is what he's kind of seeing as far as that next opportunity after after uh, the market turns around and and presents a kind of a savings on on the buy. Yeah, and I'm I'm concerned. I'm really concerned about the tech sector. I I really I really have a lot of fear for the tech sector. Um in general, I think we're we're at a 20 year swing here. I mean, 20 years ago we were dealing with a tech bubble that burst horrifically for a lot of people who were riding it high and we're in that same thing, but you know, with some of the millennials and some of the people, you know, our age and, and whatnot that haven't really I mean, we were coming out of, you know, college 20 some odd years ago like we were not heavily invested in our 401ks or anything like that but people who were are now getting close to retirement and they have been potentially enjoying that S&P run that index run with a tech and if you're listening to this this is buyer beware because the fang stocks you know Facebook Apple Amazon Netflix Google and then if you want to throw Microsoft in there you know we talked about this. This is huge. But in back in 2000, look at this. I mean, you, you know, we, we talked about Microsoft, Cisco, Intel, IBM, AOL, Time Warner, and some microsystems. Which one of those is the dog of the, you know, it's great to see Microsoft there twice, but do you see any of the other companies? You know, <laughs> Not so, at all. Yeah. So, I mean, like this yeah, is a blip. Yeah. So, I mean, are, do you have a one out of six chance of choosing the right one? Or are you going to take a you can take a massive hit. And I think last December when Apple dropped, what, 35% or something like that? I mean, in one month? I mean, that's that's horrific. I mean, I love Apple. I, mean, I have an iPhone. I mean, I have Apple equipment in my house. I have iPads and whatnot. But I think we need to understand our history and learn from it and watch out for this tech tech issue. And And those are some things that, you know, people are really kind of riding this, like, euphoria of a wave little crystal ball action going on there with you ben i'm feeling it there you go there you go (laughs) that's gonna do it for us and uh money in the news we are bringing to you a show dow 30 we're gonna lay it out there for you in just a little bit don't go anywhere we'll be right back you're listening to money on tap Hi, my name is Ben Brayshaw, one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. If you have questions when it comes to your retirement and are looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group. In today's volatile stock market, we can help you plan to find your successful retirement solution. Am I saving enough? Am I saving into the right places? Do my investments match my appetite for risk? Do I have a tax strategy that is going to help me keep more of what I earn? How can I maximize my Social Security income? If you are like most people, you are getting closer and closer to your retirement and may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. If you're in retirement, you may be wondering, am I maximizing my income while preserving my estate and caring for my family? 
we talk about all things financial in what we call three-dimensional investing, putting a plan around your financial future. If you feel that now is the time to start getting the answers to some of these questions for your own situation, give us a call at Brayshaw Financial Group at 855-226-8551. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, we have offices throughout New England and across the country. We would love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation just to meet with us, and we welcome you to our office. Call us at 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters. This is where you get an opportunity to pick up that phone. Not if you're driving. We understand that. But just pick up the phone. You can give us a call at 855-226-8551. And uh, we'd love to connect with you. You can also reach us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. Website is yourmoneyontap.com. We are talking about Dow 30K. Right now, we're not there. But we're doing a little bit of, uh, we're doing a little bit of shout out. We're calling it. We've got our crystal ball here with us, which is, you know, I don't know. That's you were talking, Ben. You were talking about people coming in and asking you, um, "What's going to happen?" And I've got door number one, door number two, door number three. You know, <laughs> that's kind of what I feel like sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, I'm kind of a I'm a short range optimist right now. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're looking at you know a ten year you know bull run again. But I, you know, and I, and we when we do investing, we really try to hedge the downside pretty heavily in a lot of the ways we work and, and things we do. But but I do think there's some euphoria. I do think we're going to see Dow 30. But again, we don't really know, right? So that's the, unfortunately the crystal ball we don't have. But there's a lot of pieces in play where I think even if we're having some trending kind of out of the market or hesitation and so forth, we have enough tailspin here to kind of, I think, push us over. But does the Dow really matter? I think that's the question. Mm, good, good question. Good question. I think I actually, uh, I saw you levitating a little bit there as you were looking into that uh, crystal ball. That's a new <laughs> trick for you. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> oh, gosh, you're funny. <laughs> so the Dow Industrial Average. Um, now, this is, I, I, I love history. I think this is probably, for me, it's some of the most um fun that I get a chance to do is to kind of dig in and find out, uh, you know, why do we have, you know, the things that we look at, what are they? Why? What's the history of some of what's taken place in, you know, something that's a bellwether out there, the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Yeah. I mean, it's like people, people put a lot of weight on the Dow because it's just such an old mechanism that we use to measure the market. It's not necessarily like any other mechanism out there that we use. And there's a lot of credence given to it by the general public, but not really by us advisors. I mean, we, yeah, the Dow's moving. Okay, whatever. But that's not the numbers I'm looking at at the screen. Are you, Seth? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I feel like I'm supposed to say no to that, Ben, but I, I love looking at the Dow. It's so fascinating. It makes everyone happy when it's up. They're like, oh, the <laughs> Dow is up. And they're like, oh, what happened to my account? And it's like, not move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Dow can move and completely be totally erroneous to anything that you're you're looking at or seeing in your retirement plan or whatever. And then yet it could be in correlation. But trust me, it's random <laughs> that it is. Right. Right. Uh, so where does it come from? This uh, this Dow, this Dow, this Dow Jones Industrial Average. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's over 100 years old. It was it was designed by Charles Dow with Edward Jones, a statistician, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average was created after they created the Dow Jones Transportation Average, so it's the second oldest, right. and it was created in 1896, and it was really meant to to measure kind of the, the industry performance as a whole. I mean, just trying to yeah. trying to grab kind of a general understanding of the, of the market. It started uh, with... It, they ahead. did that by incorporating 12 stocks. Everything ran in the world at that point in time off of 12 stocks, people. Right. And, and, and the thing <laughs> is, is like today, the Dow is only 30 stocks. It's right. not even, I mean, it's 30 stocks. I and mean, when we talk about the S&P 500, that's 500 stocks, and which is a much better averaging 
scenario of understanding our market than easily by far with the Dow. So, so Seth, I want to test you because I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't do this earlier, but uh, and I was wondering. So, name name five stocks in the Dow. Oh shoot, you are going to test me. Oh, I am. I'm testing okay. you hard. All right, all right, all right. Give me a second here. What are we looking for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's not GE. I can tell you yeah, that. G's anymore. gone. G's ripped out. That's right. Gone. Gone. Oh man. Oh, what is the Travelers? Is Travelers still in there? Um, Travelers is in there. Uh, okay. Travelers is in. That's there. That's one. Um, okay. Uh, cats are not in there anymore. Yeah. No they? cats in no. there. Cats still there. Oh, cat. Okay. Cats still there. Uh, all right, Kat. Uh, uh, C- City isn't in there anymore. I'm like going to name the ones that are not in there. Yeah, City's gone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and do, 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 do. who else? Okay, so you got Coke. You got Exxon. Yeah. I'm just going to read yeah. off. Goldman, Home Depot, IBM, Intel, Johnson & Johnson, J.P. Morgan, McDonald's, Merck, Microsoft, Nike, Pfizer, Procter & Gamble, Travelers, United Health. United Technologies, Verizon, Visa, Walmart, Walgreens, Disney. I didn't even start at the top. 3M, American Express, Apple, Boeing. Boeing. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. obviously, it's in there, but Chevron. I mean, there's, you know, it's like companies we all, I mean, you don't think about it because it's all large cap. And we all we do is talk about large cap, and you're like, oh, which one is getting in, which one get out? I mean, GE was in there for, what, 110 years, and they just pulled them out because they just crushed. And these things are changing constantly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what's interesting about the Dow and what a lot of people don't understand, it's just not an equally weighted indice. You know, so basically it doesn't matter how big the company is, Apple versus Boeing versus Coke or IBM, it doesn't matter how big they are. They just take the stock price and it's basically divided by itself, essentially. So if you're a hundred dollar stock or twenty dollar stock, you get equal weighting. It's just it's just those stocks. But what they do do is they work backwards on all the stock splits, and it's basically get back to what I would kind of call like a core value of that stock price and breaking it out. So, and then it's just divided. Now, unlike a lot of other indices, everything is usually equally weighted, and they try to weight things out so you can see a comparison. Like if one company's twice as big as the other, they'll get twice as much credence as, as the other one. And so that mm-hmm. creates a better, I think, indice of understanding the market, which is why we, we could really almost care less about the Dow when people talk to us. And they're like, oh, hey, the Dow. I have clients call me, oh, hey, the Dow was up today. I was like, oh, it was? Oh, great. You know? <laughs> and, but you tend to see a lot of movement that, you know, if, if one's up, the other one's up. You know, like if the S&P's up, the Dow's up, vice versa. They're usually moving somewhat in, in correlation of positive and negative movements, but not all the time like an example of of how that that Dow relationship works or doesn't depending on what what you like or dislike here um so a 30% gain in 309 billion JP Morgan was only good enough for 136 points while the 101 billion like a third the size um Goldman Sachs contributed four 415 points with a 36, so 36 percent increase in the the Goldman Sachs, relatively the same, or you know, six uh, percent uh, off on that as far as the gain. So a yeah. third of the gain in the asset, so a third less in the gain in the asset, but the Dow grew 250 percent more, right. comparatively. In, in right, a, yeah, so in that, yeah, wow. It's, a, it's I mean, that's not a, that's not a, a, a proportional relationship in, uh, in especially considering that's 309 billion versus 101 billion. So, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you'd think you they'd at least at, like, you'd think they'd at least be a, at least equal, right? I mean, you say, hey, this one grew right. three hundred nine million, this one grew up a hundred million. Like, well, the three hundred million should be at least the same amount of movement or more, but it's exactly opposite. It is. It's totally opposite. It sh- they should swap four hundred and fifteen and for J P Morgan and. <laughs> Folks, and you're, you're hearing it first. Over. I think we need to retire the Dow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, there, there's some, there's, there are some things there, like you, like the companies that you're talking about, those 30 that, um, that are in the Dow, uh, 30 of the most successful companies in the U S yeah. and they're global companies as well. But those are 30, I mean, those are the 30 largest companies. companies that just crush it. 
Yeah, and I think that's and I, I think that's why we're just looking at them. It's really just saying, hey, what are these companies doing? I, I mean, unfortunately, it's not equally weighted, but you know, there's been some track record to the Dow that has been valuable to people, and you know, you can't just go out and buy the Dow. You know, I mean, like buying the weighting of this, you can try to buy an indice that matches it, I guess, but you know. It's really, I mean, they're just, they're all over the place. You know, there's there's no, you're not buying tech, you're not buying, you know, a specific industry or healthcare. You're just, it's just a very peculiar mechanism for managing assets. And there may be some level of genius to it because we've obviously given it a hundred and, you know, whatever years of, of uh, attention. So that's, that's, that's important, I guess, in some level. But it's just funny how, how much people focus on the Dow. Our, our clients look at that all the time, and it's just it just doesn't have as much weight with with us because it's not an equally weighted index. And I think that's important to understand. Mm-hmm. It's a price weighted index. So very good. Yeah. So let's take a look at some of the history. What are some of, what are the uh, some of the markings or um, what we uh, experience today? Where have we traveled through with the Dow? Um, you know, I mean, the first one that really shows up is in October of 1929. The you know, great crash, uh, Black Monday, um, Dow plunged 23%, which is huge. But it's interesting to me, take a look at that as well. I mean, at this time, unless you went out and you bought, I mean, what was it, 12 stocks at that time? I'd have to take a look. Yeah, unless you went out and bought 12 stocks, these 12 stocks, it didn't really, it, I mean, it, it, it didn't really matter because now you can buy kind of the index through different vehicles. Um, uh, you know, ETFs or, or mutual funds, whatever you, you got in there, you can certainly go buy replicas of the the index, but you couldn't at that time unless you were just trying to create it on your own. Well, neither of those things existed back then. Right. So <laughs> exactly. You, you know, they, they, you know, so. So take that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you could, you could try to buy it and do it. Really. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. It's so hard to calculate. I mean, the Dow divisor was probably started off at, at 12, Okay, but because of all the working backwards and all the movement of it and so forth, the Dow divisor is like zero point one four or whatever, and it's like goes off. It looks like you know, pi. Hey Ben. <laughs> yeah. Ben, I'm just gonna have to tell you, you were you were wrong. Oh, I'm wrong. Sorry. It was six. It was sixteen point six seven. You're you right. So you're, wrong. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was, but it was a whole number. I mean, that's the whole point. You know, it's like <laughs> right, it, right. You know, it has it has had so many changes that the Dow divisor is now down to a version of like. The version of pi, it's but it's below three point one four. Pretty darn like, close. Yeah, it's yeah. Like point, you know, point one point one four six. Uh, it goes on and gone and on and on after that. And I haven't memorized it, so. <laughs> but you know, oh, Seth, well, would you make I can a tell great? You two socks out of the Dow. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. I'll tell you that that's number. horrible. <laughs> no, but you know, <laughs> but I mean, so what you're talking about with key dates, this is interesting. So the Dow is available for 34 years. Okay, the crash in 29 happens, and then. 20, it takes 25 years from there for it to get back up to surpass the pre-crash peak. 25 right. years later, just to get back and, yeah. and cover it. That's, that's huge. So we, now you're looking at you know, 60 some odd years out there and, and we're, we're, we're just barely cusping it and we're not even at Dow 1000 yet. No. Dow 1000 doesn't even come till 1972. <laughs> Okay. For yeah, another time. twenty years. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, oh, in the New York Times, this, the quote on this was: "The New York Times likened it to breaking, breaking of the four-minute mile in a run." I mean, that's that's crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was such a huge deal, and no one was ever fathoming, you know, Dow thirty thousand coming, Dow thirty thousand. So then, yeah, I'd for, like to take a look at that. I, I'm I'm curious. I I can't remember who it was. There's been a couple of folks out there that have like thrown some pretty big numbers out there on the Dow. But go go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, so what I just was going to say, but you know, from 1972 to double the 1,000 to go to 2,000, it takes 15 years to 1987. So yeah. 1987, we see Dow 2,000. See, a lot of people who don't have the history of the Dow think we've just kind of been moving up at this very generally steady pace. But but what? I mean, it's like we didn't cross Dow 15,000 until, what was it, um, 2013. It was 13, yeah. So, I mean, we're looking at so Dow. we're post. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're, we're post uh, Great Recession uh, and hitting 15,000. 
and it's not and it's not something that really people look back and talk about at this moment. You know, it's but it's really recent. Yeah, I mean, we're talking six years ago. <laughs> I mean, the Dow. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the, the the bar chart on the Dow is like it, it looks like a it looks like the the letter U on the right hand side. I mean, it's like, and yeah. it's a slow slow mechanism, and all of a sudden we hit two thousand, you know, the two thousands and the Dow. I mean, from Ben has Ben has raised four children and gotten them through college in that amount of time, folks. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, we didn't cross. I mean, think about it. So the Dow was at in in 1999. The Dow was crossed 11,000, and in 20 years, we've gone from 11,000. It took 113 years to get to 11,000, and it's taken 20 years to get to over 27,000. It's really wow. hard to evaluate the Dow as something to monetize inside your portfolio. And I think that's one of the things that's really complicated because the returns and so forth don't necessarily mimic what you are potentially doing or not doing. That's just one of those things. I mean, it's, that's why I think I like the S and P 500 so much is that you have 11 sectors, there's sector rotation, there's investments that you can do that way. You can focus on healthcare, you can focus on industrials, you can look at equal weighted, the Dow is such a skew. I feel so bad for liking the Dow. I know, but it's... Now that you say it that way, I'm just like, what was I thinking? Well, it's exciting. I mean, <laughs> I, I turn on the TV. I'm, I'm a jerk. I'm talking about it, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I turn on CNBC, and it's like, boom, there's the Dow. Oh, the Dow's up today. Oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I yeah. Mean, it's the same thing. <laughs> It doesn't matter who you are, but then I'm like, I don't really care. What's I'm waiting for the thing to scroll through to the you know, to the Nasdaq or the S and P or whatever mm-hmm. you know, and to see what we're looking for. So it's just kind yeah. of funny, but we all get this kind of happy feeling when we see the green Dow, and, and they play it mm-hmm. up so well. Yeah. Oh, the Dow is the Dow is down today. The Dow is down. So, hey, anyways, it's just an interesting an interesting conversation around how to understand. Marking your mark, you're marking your investments to the market properly. Yeah, yeah. So right now, where we where we sit, we're uh, uh, gosh, what are we? If we were, I think we're eleven percent off of thirty thousand, roughly, in yeah. terms of the Dow. Yeah, eleven, twelve. Yeah, and we, which coming back full circle on, um, you know, how soon is it gonna? Are we gonna get there? Yep. Yeah, I mean, eleven percent really isn't that big of a move. I mean, maybe maybe. I mean, it, well, it's nice. I'm not going to say it's not great, but I mean, it might be a year. But if you were to take a look back, it might be, you know, a couple of months. But um, something interesting about the market is that markets can also be moved by this in, investor sentiment that's happening. And a potential factor there is that people just want the Dow to hit 30. So they keep throwing I, it at it, you know? Yeah, like, it is. Let's just... <laughs> yeah, I Let's mean, push if, it. if Boeing, you know, if Boeing gets a gets a bump and things happen, I mean, you know, those are the types of things. It's like the Dow's still growing, and yet, you know, Boeing is like in the news constantly, right? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I think Southwest is pulling out of Newark, New Jersey. I, I think I read an article on that yeah. because yeah, of the Boeing event. You know, I mean, there's losses right. left and right. So, what's going to happen to Boeing, and how might that hold back the Dow? Right? Those are things that you want to kind of be aware of. I think. I think understanding the Dow is helpful because it really gives people a better perspective on knowing how to articulate that against their their portfolio. But I also think there's a little bit inside the Dow where, you know, if we do get, you know, what what happens if China trade deal happens, and what what hap- you know if it goes through? I mean, the relief I think our market will feel, I think, is going to be huge. I think if we get that trade deal, I think I think the Fed's going to look at things a little differently. We're going to have more cash coming to America. There's just going to be a lot more more activity, I think, happening, and I think a lot of those concerns and woes will be pushed aside. And I think we do see Dow thirty thousand before the end of the year, if that's the case. Yeah. Do we see it in a couple of years? It might take that. Good. That's an interesting idea. What 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 do you see in a couple of years? Do you see? 
do you see down? I mean, we went from 20 to 30, it seems like overnight. It was just 2017 that we hit that 20,000 and we were talking about the Dow 20 on Money on Tap. <laughs> right. No, no, I know. We First were. Dow show. I, yeah. I mean, we, yeah. Hey, we called that. <laughs> so, yeah. I still haven't figured out what in the world's in the Dow. And it's taken me two, <laughs> that was two years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the thing, the thing that, the thing about this that's really very funny, though, is that, you know, we are continuing to say what's going to happen in the market. And you know what? The political climate we have right now, you know, I used to, when I first got into the business, someone used to tell me, don't ever talk about politics or religion. Don't ever talk about politics or religion. And it's like... But those are our two favorite things to... to our country mean, is that's, designed that's to talk about me. politics and religion. Every that's why you call me at like three a.m. when you're like getting up and and East Coast. You're like Seth. Have you seen what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it, talking about fall. politics and religion, these are real things. I mean, these are real things that are going to affect our economy. And if you can't, even whether you agree or disagree with anything I think or whatever, we we will all agree that politics and religion will drive events in the market. If we have a if we have a, a military attack on Iran tomorrow we are going to have an event in our market if we have if we have a if Gosh. south korea decides to launch a missile that's live into another country we are going to have a market event if if trump gets elected or doesn't get reelected we are going to have a market event around that those are facts and it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you stand on either of those issues we all know that we have to address those things and and when people come to us what do they come to us for to manage and mitigate those issues. I was going to say they, uh, they come to us to, you know, ask us what's behind door number three. You're listening to, to uh, <laughs> Money on Tap. We are talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Before you come back, I'm going to go do a little bit of research here and figure out uh, where Ben got that snazzy list of 30 stocks that are actually in the, the Dow. We're going to be right back <laughs> talking about the Dow. You're listening to Money on Tap. Hi, my name is Seth Crustman, partner with Brayshaw Financial Group and one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. One of the biggest concerns and largest expenses people face today is taxes. Without thoughtful planning, taxes can destroy future retirement dollars, eliminating the possibility of a timely retirement or dreams of what you want retirement to look like. If you're like most people, you're getting closer and closer to retirement, and you may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. Will my income be enough? Will rising taxes force me to give up my dreams? How does inflation factor into all of this? These are real concerns and you're not alone. Putting a plan around your financial future is what we do. If you have questions when it comes to your financial security, and if you're looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group, 855-226-8551. It's time for you to start getting answers to your questions. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, Brayshaw Financial has offices across the country. We'd love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation to meet with us. Call us at 855-226-8551. 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. If you're just joining us, we've been talking about the Dow. Ben has been saving my bacon today because I... (laughs) I'm going to come clean. I like to say I know all 30 stocks of the Dow by heart, but... I really don't. And if you had asked me which five were there, I would have probably named five that were pulled out. <laughs> All right. We got we to than... cut that out because, because really what happened was Ben grabbed the, the, uh, the crystal ball from me uh, <laughs> and started looking into it and being able to you know, read uh, what's going to happen or what has even happened or what's currently happening in the Dow. Um, but we're going to bring it back because we've said, hey, this Dow thing, we've talked about the history. And we've, we've talked about um, kind of the why the Dow isn't really – something that we look at as any kind of a indicator around the marketplace just because of the size of it. Um, the, the stocks that are in it are, you know, can be great, but, um, but it's only 30. There's only 30 stocks in comparison to like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or some of these other indexes out there. But we're going to bring it back, I think, here to what you can pull out of the Dow and potentially how you can read 
into the Dow. Yeah, I really like this, Seth. I mean, you know, one of the things that we, we, you know, we don't look at the Dow a lot, but what we can, what we can say is, yeah, it's the 30 largest companies usually in America and how they add and subtract people, you know, companies out of it is, is up to the Dow Jones. But that being said, there's a lot of components to the Dow Jones that you can look at outside of it, technical analysis that you can, you can kind of pull from that. What is going on in the Dow right now? Like there's like a few stocks that are kind of people are concerned about in the Dow and, and what they could mm-hmm. do in a, in a negative environment, what's kind of going on with them. And, and those stocks specifically are Caterpillar, Boeing, Exxon, and, and J&J, Johnson & Johnson. They alone, if, if, if they crush, if they get pulled out of the Dow or whatever, they account for about 18% of the gain. We could see a hit of 18% on that scenario. That's a concerning factor. And Boeing has some real issues. I mean, they got some real lawsuits going on. I mean, people are losing business big time mm-hmm. because of Boeing. These are concerns that could take our $30,000 $30, Dow prediction right off the table very, very quickly. Don't say that. I would hate to eat my words in a year where the Dow is at 25 and I told you it was going to be 30. Well, it's going to be 30 someday. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's a relief. <laughs> so 16 of the 30 names in the Dow right now uh, is what we were talking about here with the uh, are in some kind of a bearish technical setup um, besides the Exxon, Boeing, Johnson and Johnson. Uh, and and what does that mean? I mean, technical indicators are some of those trading indicators that are that are used by tactical traders or under trying to understand the underlying uh, holdings in, in the Dow. Uh, and one of them is called. Uh, or is called a death cross, and that's uh, basically these these three, the Dow of uh, members of Exxon and Boeing and Johnson and Johnsons, are close to this death cross territory. Sixteen of the thirty names in the Dow are uh, in some kind of a bearish technical setup at this point. Um, and then you know that's just the Dow that doesn't even really get into um, the S and P five hundred. There's definitely a, a so, a fair amount. Yes. Uh, like 15, I think it's about 15%. Yeah, 15%. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. and that's, and I think that's where we're really kind of, the market has a lot of like, hmm, what's going on? What, what are we doing here? And, and how is that going to impact me? And, and should I take, and honestly, I think the hesitancy is fair. I think the hesitancy, they, they, you know, the amount of money going into the market, new money and things like that, there's definitely a sideline presence. And yeah. that's something that, you know, people watch. They watch trends. They watch the number of trades that are made below what they call even lots. You know, like if you're if you're if you're a small investor and you're buying two hundred dollar shares of Apple and you buy, you know, eighty five shares because you've just got enough money to get that many shares in, that's not an even lot. And there's there's technical analysis that's managing and watching those lot purchases to see how much is potentially like the average Joe investor and what's institutional. And they're watching that. There's a mood. There's a swing. And there's a lot of technical analysis and, and strategy around how investing is occurring. And that's really interesting because with the sidelining of a lot of money, it shows that America is a little hesitant to say, am I in it? Am I buying at the top right now? Yeah. Well, I, I just want to Johnson, see something, right? Yeah. Johnson & Johnson historically has been one of those um, places, kind of a bit of a flight to safety. I mean, this is a blue chip stock. Yeah. But – uh, if the if the economy's really taken a, a turn, Johnson and Johnson's one of those that a lot of people will go and move their money over into because you know it just doesn't move as quickly. It's a little less risky of a of a of a stock out there uh, just because of the size and the weight. But I mean, even in comparison to Boeing, which is about nine point three per nine percent, I I don't know if it's at that current level now in the Dow. Uh, it's it's not even as big. But the other indicator there might be your um, uh, Exxon Mobil, right? Right. With uh, which is historically, I mean, gosh, I'm trying to think back. When was Exxon the largest company in the world? I think that's 2000. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's around that 2007 ish time, I think. And and I can't remember yeah, uh, when they got taken yeah. over. Yeah, right. Exactly. And you know, I mean, but there's all this technical stuff that's happening with these companies. And and one of the things that we use and we use heavily with a lot of the managers we work with is that 200 day moving average average work that we do in the backside of, of one of the technical indicators. And that's a pretty common technical indicator is, is, is looking at 200 days of moving average of an asset or an indice or a, 
a sector or something along those lines and watching that money move or that asset move in value and it starts trending to a negative. It starts dipping that that average. And then they look at things like 50-day moving averages and there's like kind of these guardrails as we call it on both sides of those things and and they're looking for trends that are, are going to break through. They're looking for the 50-day moving average pushing through a guardrail or the 50-day moving average pushing through that 200-day moving average. And when those things happen, those are concerning event factor items that you know are really driving a lot of this thought process. And that's what's happened with Caterpillar. Mm-hmm. Caterpillar has had some, some, some poor earnings. They've had some, some things where you know they've had some losses and, and whatnot, and their 50-day has crossed their 200-day moving average line. Right. And that's an and indicator. that can be a leading indicator, right? Because it's an industry. I mean, that's when people are buying cat when they are putting infrastructure in. Right, exactly. And, and we're growing. That's when cat's on the rise. When cat's coming down, you know, we start taking a look. It goes back to that uh, small cap index that uh, we were talking about before. Yeah, and you know, and I, you know, and I think I'm not ready to cancel cat out yet. And I'll tell you why, Seth. You know, I mean, the reason I'm not ready to cancel cat just out entirely, and I think that's why a little bit of the hesitancy in the marketplace exists, is because when we brought a trillion dollars back from the from the repatriation tax benefit, you know, allowing companies to bring money back to the United States and that trillion dollars. There is a lot of stock buyback, which is helping our market create some substance as I you know, was talking about earlier. But I really think that ultimately that's infrastructure dollars that were being held for Europe and Dubai and a lot of the places that China was claiming that a lot of the steel selling was going to happen, which is why they were concerned about buying our bonds at one point. And I think that when you actually break this out, I really think that, that those assets, though they're going to buy back a lot of stock, that's going to drive a lot of their U.S. equity and value. And I think that's going to drive more of a you know, you know, construction-based thinking. I don't think we've hit that. I mean, that tax just happened last year. That means, like, if you're an architect, you know, you're building something, you're working on something, like, there's such a delay in the time and the, and the work involved before, boom, the caterpillars in the ground dig in a hole. I mean, right? I mean... Yeah, I, I totally, I 100% agree with you here, Ben. These are, these are movements and fluctuations. And just because one or two of these start to appear doesn't necessarily mean that it's enough to really try to gauge or, or, or judge or look into that crystal ball again of what's coming down the pipe in the next year or the next two years because we've seen sectors roll out that are leading indicators and roll right back in. Yeah, and know? I think and I, I wonder if what's going on is kind of a settling effect because you have the kind of the, the kind of the coming down of, of one tax code, one market increase, one one event financially that has our country has been growing off of. And now you have this kind of new event where we have the buyback of stock and the prep of all this a trillion dollars coming into our economy essentially from the repatriation tax. I wonder if we're like kind of coming out of a lull of one, if you could say, I'm, I'm doing it with my hands right now. I know you're watching me, but like, you know, hey, one's everybody, kind of, this is great visualization that he's yeah, got if you going can see, on. I, we're going to get to Facebook live one day, but you know, <laughs> if, if one's dipping, but the other tax code, the other benefit of that trillion dollars is kind of starting to pick up that pace. And I wonder if we're just kind of in a segment of time, a few years segment of time where we don't see cranes rocking our skylines because I, I mean they are right now i mean you you go down to boston i mean there's cranes everywhere but you know i was in england a, yeah. a couple of years ago and there was cranes literally everywhere like if you took a picture every picture seemed to have a crane in it and i i think i don't know i, I think we haven't really seen the benefit the entire benefit of that and i think you know china's gdp has been growing at six seven plus percent and when it's not that high they're in a recession almost <laughs> But I think that's because our tariffs are so low. I think they were able to capitalize on significant growth in that. I think that with a tariff increase, that's gonna. I think that's really going to help us as a country, not just for the next, you know, if you're a Trump fan, not for the next just four years. This tariff negotiation is going to help us indefinitely until that tariff changes again. And it's something that we need to kind of bring some of that, you know, that growth to America by doing that. And China is going to try to sell us that steel. And I, you know... I'm a proponent of of seeing some some growth in this. So I'm not I'm not selling out on I'm not selling out on cat yet. Good call. I think that's going to do it for us here. Uh, we've been having a lot of fun talking about the Dow. Uh, you heard it here first. Dow 30k. Um, I think we should be there. I don't know in a month or two. That's kind of my <laughs> guess. 
<laughs> it's only 11 percent. It'll happen. It's going to be there. But uh, yeah, so we, we dove into a little bit of the history. We dove into the reasons uh, around that and some of the some of the components and how it's built, uh, what it could mean, what it might not mean, what their perspective around the DAO is. So hopefully uh, you've had some fun with us here today. And if you have any questions, if you want to give us a call and have the DAO talk, We'd love it. You can get a you can get a hold of us at 855-226-8551 and uh, info at yourmoneyontap.com. My name is Seth Crossman. And I'm Ben Brayshaw. You've been listening to Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit or protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.